Uh, I'll start off telling you a little bit about myself. I have a consultancy called Fab Riders, um, and essentially I work with um, grassroots organizations, activists, and advocates um, from what a wide range of uh, fields and disciplines um, on using information effectively. And that means packaging it, it means collecting it, and it also means protecting it. Um, I, I have a very strong passion for working with marginalized and vulnerable communities. Um, and you can find a lot on my site about that. Um, I've recently gotten this thing up from uh, a session where I met Javier uh, at the Responsible Data Forum about working specifically with vulnerable communities and data. But for this conversation, I want to talk a little bit about um, the evolution of information security. And I'm going to um, tell you that from both a very personal standpoint, but then also a very professional one. Um, I want to look at the stuff that, is, that makes us vulnerable. Um, and that's more of the, you know, the things that we're using that make us vulnerable. And the folks that we're working with, come on in, that makes us vulnerable. Um, I also am going to look at what are the problems with on online services, but also with the security tools um, that we're using. Um, and then I'm going to give you some frameworks for making sure that the information that you are working with is secure and making sure that you're not, pe um, you're not making people vulnerable. Um, and also within that, uh, looking at what is the responsibility of collecting data. And I'll end with giving you some tools and resources I want to start off just giving you a little bit of a background on sort of why we're here and why we're in this space now that, that we're in. Um, first with a, just a personal story. So I, um, I'm a gay man. Um, I uh, came of age in San Francisco. And I'm sure all of you are going, yeah, that must have been great. That was really fun. Um, I came of age in San Francisco in the 80s. And that was a very dark time, um, largely because of the spread of the AIDS virus. And um, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the politicians were scapegoating using the AIDS virus for political advantage. Um, and one, that meant treatment was not being done in a really, really good way. Um, but also, you know, we had a lot of crazy dialogue going on about gathering everybody up, and not just people that were HIV positive, but um, people that were gay, and putting them into camps so that we could protect the rest of the population. So this set up a, a whole thing of fear um, in the gay community, both around coming out, but then also started uh, uh, an issue about getting tested. So um, uh, thankfully, there were some really good healthcare people that thought that through. And when they went to promote getting tested, one of the things that was really strongly promoted with that is if you go to get tested, it will be <coughs> anonymous. So when I went to get tested, I was, um, you know, I went into the clinic, I gave them no information about me, right? They took my blood sample and gave me a number and said, come back in, a, I can't remember what it was, two weeks or whatever, um, back in those days. And of course, you know, you had the two weeks of absolutely dreaded fear. But when I went back, I just gave them the number and they gave me the test result. So my identity within that the whole time was completely, um, you know, secure. And I actually did feel like, okay, you know, because I knew I hadn't given them any information at all. Um, and also, this is a very different time. So, you know, there's not a lot of computers around. Um, and, and not only that, those computers are not uh, interconnected. We're, there wasn't the internet, and they weren't all connected to all that. So there was a lot of you know what I mean? Like, now we, we have to consider very different things. So one thing that's really deeply changed since then um, is uh, the, the rise of the relational database, right? 
So one thing now, when we're collecting information, um, it, it goes in a, into a database that's connected to many other databases. And for me, this was something that, because um, I started working with activists uh, largely in the 90s, and uh, it was really interesting, you know, it was, it was like a godsend. Oh my God, we can connect all these different things. We can connect, um, you know, stuff about our members, who our members are connected to and all that. And it just opened up this wide thing of like, that was great for activists, right? To be able to collect information about members and, and keep them on track. However, this has gone a little bit crazy now, right? So we have the internet, we're constantly connected, and information is constantly being connected, and these relational databases have become something completely different. Um, so what is all this stuff now that we're using, right? All these different things that we are currently using, right? There, every time we go and we put in information, um, into any of these things, they are going off of our computers, across the internet, and being collected somewhere, right? Um, and I mean, I can go through, I can go through each one of these things and explain to you why they're um, vulnerable or why they make you vulnerable and all that, but we don't have that amount of time and that could take all day. The main thing is it comes down to just about everything we do on the internet, okay? Then we enter in the mobile, right? So now not only are we you know, connecting to databases um, via the internet, we're doing it via our mobile and it's adding on all sorts of other information like you know, your location, um, times, all that different stuff. Um, and not only that, then it's becoming, um, you know, your conversations uh, that are going on on this. Um, it's not just the internet. It was stuff that we used to take for granted. You know, you picked up a landline and you had a conversation with someone at the other end of the landline. Somebody had to be connected to that physically in order to listen to you. Now it's a lot easier with the mobile. Have I terrified everyone yet? Sorry. So, let, I did, um, so one of the major things that we, we, we're doing um, is we're forgetting, right? We're, we're sort of forgetting about all this and we're forgetting about all, all the different stuff. And it's basically um, around convenience, right? It's really easy for us to get a lot of stuff back from this, right? I used my mobile this morning to get me from here to the train station or from the train station to here, right? I didn't even think about it at all. I just pick up my phone, enter in the thing, and it's giving me directions and all that. I'm not thinking about that information. Sorry. No worries. Um, uh, but the thing that we forget more than anything is if we're not paying for services, we are the product, right? So anytime you pick up something, any. And the other thing, too, that's quite ironic about this, now even when we do pay for stuff, often um, they are still using us as a product, right? So there's this sort of, we, we have this, this, this sense, and this is the other thing, too, like, you know, a lot of us are more aware of these things, but generally, if you're an activist or an advocate and you're trying to get people involved in your campaign and you're trying to get them to share stuff and, you know, and all that, um, we forget that, that most folks, I mean, we're thinking about this more because we're activists and advocates and we're understanding. Um, we have a much more, you know, our mindsets are more geared to this. But, you know, people themselves are much more thinking about the convenience aspect rather than, you know, how, is, how are they becoming a product. It's not at the forefront of everyone's minds. So, um, uh, we're all using online services. It's really convenient. Um, so what are the problems with this? <laughs> How many of you have uh, recognized the symbol? This is only something that's appeared within the last week. But essentially, this is um, uh, an icon for something called Heartbleed, which is a vulnerability um, on the internet. Basically, 
it's intertwined with a lot of services that we're using. And it means that all that information that even when we thought it was secure is not. So the problem with online services, the problem with anything going off your computer, even if you do trust it, right? Even if you trust that it is um, going off to a safe space because you've been told it's encrypted, you've, you know, you've, you've got all the right protocols going and all that. Even then, it's one, it's going out of your control, but there's lots of things that could be going on that is going to make um, even the encrypted stuff not be encrypted. And there's lots of other things that we've been learning about uh, recently with Eric Snowden and, and WikiLeaks and all those things about back doors coming into these things and all that. So we're less likely to trust these things. Plus, how many people here know the, now the, the, the connection between Connie Rice and Dropbox? I saw the logo and no idea what it was about. <coughs> I saw it on just people okay. showing it this morning. On. How many people here use Dropbox? How many people would not use Dropbox if Con Condoleezza Rice was on their board? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that's come out in the last week as well. And the, uh, the, the thing more about this, um, I mean, yes, okay, Condoleezza Rice, promoting torture, promoting tapping, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and she's now being put, being put on the board of this. One of the things that we forget when we're going for these services is the values of the people that have put these services together and, 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 and do, are they shared values with us? Are they shared values with our community? So we go for this, oh my God, it's easy to use. Look at all this great stuff. I can have, you know, the stuff on my work laptop it, at my home and, you know, I don't have to think about it and all that. But the people behind this, right, are they really thinking um, oh, I need, you know, we need to protect this stuff and we really need to, to make it encrypted. Or are they more, more inclined to want to get you there so that they can be doing lots of different stuff with it? So my big question, which is quite small, <laughs> why are we surprised, right? So everything that, we, that we've been learning over the last year, year and a half with Snowden and, and WikiLeaks and all those things, like, why does that surprise us? Um, Basically, you know, if there are ways for people to get at information and make use of it, they will, right? Why are we surprised that um, governments that have been so caught up in preventing terrorism and surveilling and now wanting to watch not only the terrorists but the activists and the advocates as well, we find out that they're actually, you know, are collecting all this data um, and going through it. So what, why does that surprise us? Right? Um, so, <laughs> so there's all this. There's all this stuff with, with the online world. Um, then the other issue that we have is uh, the problem with security tools. So, um, I mean, there's one thing that I just talked about, which is the back doors and the encryptions and all that stuff and how fallible that really is. <coughs> But there's other problems with security tools. Um, probably the most, uh, the, the, the issue that I encounter more than anything is um, that they're, they're often counterintuitive and they're not in the reach of mere mortals. So um, if I am working with advocates who are trying to get people to use online tools to get information, to do crowdsourcing and things like that. Um, the mere mortals, you know, the people that they're trying to reach are not likely to be using this stuff, nor are they likely to be capable of using it. Um, the other issue is their use often arises, um, arouses suspicion. So one of the things that's quite interesting with uh, NSA stuff is um, they looked for people that were using encryption and, and, and targeted them and, and got a lot more looking at So if you were using Tor or encrypted email um, during that time or in the surveillance, you became a target, right? So they often arise suspicion. The other problem is it becomes an arms race. So you can be thinking that 
the digital security tool is safe and secure um, and all that, but then suddenly somebody does find a back door or in the case um, like Iran where Tor is very widely used, um, they, they cut off the, uh, the ports to it. They just, all they had to do was just turn off the, the ports that they communicated on and it was, it was dead in the water. So, information about us is being shared everywhere. Online services are completely insecure and are making money off the information they are collecting. They also don't share our values. And there's problematics with security tools. So, what about just using a notebook? Right. What about just pen and paper? I did some uh, research for uh, uh, a group called Article 19 um, around uh, Iran and security stuff. Um, and I had an opportunity to, to interview a whole bunch of Iranian dissidents about um, their experiences. Um, one of the stories that came up that was really interesting when I was doing that was the story f about a woman who uh, traveled uh, to Iran in the 90s and she was, uh, I think it, she was a, it, somebody involved in the Dutch government. So she went and she had uh, meetings inside um, with all sorts of different activists. And what she did was she wrote names down and, and contact information in her notebook to take back. Um, when she got to the airport, she was uh, uh, detained and all of her stuff was gone through. They found her notebook and they collected all that information, right? So, as a result of her writing all that in the notebook, she put all those folks at risk and they were all rounded up and interrogated. Um, they no longer trusted her, right? So essentially all her work was blown out of the water as a result of putting all this stuff in the notebook. Um, so for me, that brings up another way of looking at it. And I think, um, you know, going back to both my experience in the 80s, but looking at, um, you know, at the, this lady's experiences, what we're forgetting is it's not so much about the tools. It's not so much um, about, you know, the internet or the mobile phones or anything like that. It's about us. It's about our behavior and it's about how we're handling information ourselves. So it's much more important for us to be aware of information and be aware of uh, the implications of that information and what are the risks. So um, if you are sharing information, um, there's three things that you should always be thinking about. Um, you should be thinking about what are your assets, what is valuable, but not only that, to whom, um, what are the threats? What are the risks? So if you can think about those three things in connection to your information, you're on your way to making it more secure. So to talk about each one of these a little bit. So assets. How is the information valuable? Um, and th th this is the bit too. We have to really be thinking not just about ourselves. So there's the one thing about, okay, so I've, I've gathered all this information. Um, it is valuable to me because it is showing that this problem is happening or um, these are folks that I can get to an another meeting or, you know what I mean, um, these are, are good contacts. So there's this issue of how is this valuable to me, to my organization, to my activism, to my movement? The other thing, how is this information valuable to other people, right? And why would they want to get a hold of it? So, you know, any time there are networks, um, groupings of people, right, that becomes very attractive to the authorities and all that to be thinking, you know, okay, if we, that's really good information to be getting, we could now be um, watching those folks. So when we're thinking about information, we not only have to think about how is it valuable to us, and why it's important for us to protect it, but also why other people might want to be having access to it. Um, what is the threats? 
So what are the threats to the information? Um, confidentiality, uh, keeping assets or knowledge about assets away from unauthorized parties, right? Is confidentiality a threat? Is the integrity of it a threat? Um, <coughs> keeping the assets undamaged or unaltered while you have them. Um, availability, so can people get to it that are authorized and should be getting to it? Um, is there consistency? Is the assets behaving and working as is expected all the time? So does it work that way all the time that you're using it? Um, do you have control or are you gonna lose control um, to the assets? And uh, can you audit it? Can you always verify that the assets are secure and are what they're supposed to be? So when we talk about risk, what we're talking about is the likelihood of a threat actually occurring. Um, and so how likely are these things? Um, ooh, consistency. Anyways, um, love it when that happens. Um, but <laughs> um, so, so, you know, in relation to your information, can you look at each one of these things and, and think about what are the threats in regards to it? Um, but there's other, there, there's, there's those layers and that's the stuff about the information itself. But then the other piece is your responsibility as an activist around doing data collection. So um, uh, you need to be always be thinking about, um, and, the, and in terms of confidentiality, but you should always be thinking about how information can be traced back to real, um, real people. And the bit of this is also understanding identifiers, right? Um, what are things that identify people? And what are ways that people could be identified? So, you know, what are the implications on that? And one of the things that um, I've encountered recently, I'm doing some work uh, in Eastern Europe, working with a group called the Eurasian Harm Reduction Network. And they're working on a campaign to expose police violence that is occurring against women who use drugs. Um, so in order to expose it, this first year what we're doing is getting them, getting um, different uh, partners within the region to be putting on a map uh, places where women who use drugs have experienced violence. Now one of the things that's been quite interesting, um, we started looking at that data and realized that um, time and location would be an identifier to a police officer that had committed violence, right? So if we were making that freely available and police officers could get a hold of it, then we were um, likely to be making the women even more vulnerable than they were. So the campaign has actually now changed track and what they're doing is collecting information not about the violence itself, but about the police stations. So what's happening, um, it's, it's, a, it's a different center. So now they're going for, okay, let's look at um, police uh, districts where the violence is happening more. So still collecting information on, on women, but changing the scope and also changing how the information is being displayed to give better protection to the women. Um, uh, and I think the, the flip side of that and the bit that, that we absolutely have to be concerned about when we're collecting data um, is do we have consent? So as I mentioned before, you know, we're all working with, um, with folks that uh, are, are, have different levels of understandings of the implications of the data. So if we are collecting data and we want to use them, it is our duty to be making sure that they understand uh, how we are going to use the data, what we want to use it for, and that also we are being very clear about what the risks are, right? Part of that is really good because that, you know, that really helps to make much stronger and educated folks that are then going to be much more deeply involved in your campaign because they understand both that you, what you're trying to accomplish and also, um, you know, that you're actually taking that extra step to think through um, how it, it makes them all vulnerable. 
Um, but if you're not doing this, you're probably not any better than any of those online services. When you are looking at security solutions and, and tools that you want to use, so there are going to be times when uh, it is worth it to, um, to use these tools and you are going to want to mitigate or lessen the, the threats as much as possible. Um, here's five questions to be thinking about. So what, what are the actual assets? You know, what are you trying to protect? Um, again, what are the risks? But then how well does the security solution mitigate those risks, right? Is it actually effective? Is it going to do what it is that you want to do? Um, what other risks does the security solution cause? So one of the things you know, I mentioned before is about sometimes you use it and that arouses suspicion, right? And you get, you get, looks at, and you get looked at unintentionally. Um, what are costs and trade-offs that the security solution imposed? Now, one, um, one of the things that often happens with the security solution, um, again, also is, is ease of use, right? Is it something that um, people are, are going to be able to use, or does even the installation of it themselves stop people from being able to use it? I've had this happen over and over again trying to, to use PGP. Um, for email encryption and uh, having problems at uh, different ends. Anyways, um, this is from Bruce Schneier's book, Beyond Fear. Um, very good stuff. Um, so you do have to use this stuff. Um, this is, is, for me, the stuff that I found um, that I'm using routinely. There's obviously a lot more and, and uh, uh, stuff that Javier's mentioned. But, um, um, password managers uh, are really, really critical. And this is one of the things, too, because we've talked about identifiers. Um, suddenly, you know, you're putting your username and password into a site. Now we've seen through Heartbleed that, and a lot of different instances, where people are actually able to get that information. So if you're using the same username and password with every service that you use, it's likely that they are then able to, to go in and get it. So um, you know, when stuff like this happens, like there's been a big blitz going on about telling everybody they need to go change their passwords everywhere. Absolutely unmanageable is having different passwords for different sites unless you're using a password manager that can keep track of all the different passwords for you. The problem is your, pardon? Isn't that a one stop shop for yeah. one password? Absolutely. So, but this is the thing like how, you know, you have to be thinking through like how, so one of the things about a password manager is you're putting all your passwords in there and then you use one password to get into the password manager. So if anyone gets that one password and your password manager Right? What use is it? It's not about becoming disempowered. It's about becoming from a point of, of empowerment. You have to understand how the information makes people vulnerable. That's the most important thing. And then being able to communicate that in a way where what you're doing is protecting, mm -hmm. not scaring. You're protecting. You're wanting to say, OK, we're, we're, we're not wanting to do that via text message because people will be able to very easily read those text messages. So let's think about other ways of communicating that information. Often, you know, um, times and locations of meetings and stuff like that, you have to think of some creative ways of communicating that rather than doing it over text if that is um, a space that um, the authorities are going to be really, really interested in. But just to remind you, um, you know, always be thinking about your assets, your risks, and your threats. Be responsible in your data collection. Um, and consider using the security tools only after you've assessed their impact. Um, some resources to leave you with. EFFs, um, the whole stuff I, uh, on assets, threats, threats, and risks, they've got a really good walkthrough on it. And that'll really help you out. If you are not aware of Tactical Tech, who's my former employer, uh, their PROTECT program, they have excellent uh, guides, both in how to use the tools, but also frameworks for thinking of it. 
One of the things that they've uh, done recently and gotten a lot of um, acclaim for is the Me and My Shadow website, where you can go in and plug in uh, information about your online services, and it will show you how you're vulnerable. So that's very good. Um, you can also see more of me um, in these Article 19's online protection videos where I have gone over a lot of the points that I've raised here. Um, but there's also quite a few other um, really good, helpful videos that are there as well. <laughs>